Commission to study the problem. Their report clearly blamed the monetary contraction on the national bankers. The report is interesting because it compares the deliberate money contraction by the national bankers after the Civil War to the fall of the Roman Empire. The disaster of the Dark Ages was caused by decreasing money and falling prices. Without money, civilization could not have had a beginning, and with a diminishing supply, it must languish and, unless relieved, finally perish. At the Christian era, the metallic money of the Roman Empire amounted to $1,800,000,000. By the end of the 15th century, it had shrunk to less than $200 million. History records no other such disastrous transition as that from the Roman Empire to the Dark Ages. Despite this report by the Silver Commission, Congress took no action. The next year, 1877, riots broke out from Pittsburgh to Chicago. The torches of starving vandals lit up the sky. The bankers huddled to decide what to do. They decided to hang on. Now that they were back in control to a certain extent, they were not about to give it up. At the meeting of the American Bankers Association that year, they urged their membership to do everything in their power to put down the notion of a return to greenbacks. The ABA secretary, James Buell, authored a letter to the members which blatantly called on the banks to subvert not only Congress, but the press. It is advisable to do all in your power to sustain such prominent daily and weekly newspapers, especially the agricultural and religious press, as will oppose the greenback issue of paper money, and that you will also withhold patronage from all applicants who are not willing to oppose the government issue of money. To repeal the act creating banknotes or to restore to circulation the government issue of money will be to provide the people with money and will therefore seriously affect our individual profits as bankers and lenders. See your congressman at once and engage him to support our interest that we may control legislation. As political pressure mounted in Congress for change, the press tried to turn the American people away from the truth. The New York Tribune put it this way on January 10th, 1878. The capital of the country is organized at last, and we will see whether Congress will dare to fly in its face. But it didn't work entirely. On February 28, 1878, Congress passed the Sherman Law, allowing the minting of a limited number of silver dollars, ending the five-year hiatus. This did not end gold backing of the currency, however, nor did it completely free silver. Previous to 1873, anyone who brought silver to the U.S. Mint could have it struck into silver dollars free of charge. No longer. But at least some money began to flow back into the economy again. With no further threat to their control, the bankers loosened up on loans, and the post-Civil War Depression was finally ended. Three years later, the American people elected Republican James Garfield president. Garfield understood how the economy was being manipulated. As a congressman, he had been chairman of the Appropriations Committee and was a member of Banking and Currency. After his inauguration, he slammed the money changers publicly in 1881. Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled, one way or another, by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. Unfortunately, within a few weeks of making this statement, on July 2nd of 1881, he was assassinated. The money changers were gathering strength fast. They began a periodic fleecing of the flock, as they called it, by creating economic booms followed by further depressions so they could buy up thousands of homes and farms for pennies on the dollar. In 1891, the money changers prepared to take the American economy down again, and their methods and motives were laid out with shocking clarity in a memo sent out 
by the American Bankers Association, the ABA, an organization in which most bankers were members. Notice that this memo called for bankers to create a depression on a certain date three years in the future. According to the congressional record, here's how it read in part. On September 1st, 1894, we will not renew our loans under any consideration. On September 1st, we will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two-thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi and thousands of them east of the Mississippi as well at our price. Then the farmers will become tenants, as in England. These depressions could be controlled because America was on the gold money standard. Since gold is scarce, it's one of the easiest commodities to manipulate. People wanted silver money legalized again so they could escape the stranglehold the money changers had on gold money. People wanted silver money reinstated, reversing Mr. Said's Act of 1873, by then called the Crime of 73. By 1896, the issue of more silver money had become the central issue in the presidential campaign. William Jennings Bryan, a senator from Nebraska, ran for president as a Democrat on the free silver issue. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, he made an emotional speech which won him the nomination entitled Crown of Thorns and Cross of Gold. Though Bryan was only 36 years old at the time, this speech is widely regarded as the most famous oration ever made before a political convention. In the dramatic conclusion, Bryan said, We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The bankers lavishly supported the Republican candidate, William McKinley, who favored the gold standard. The resulting contest was amongst the most fiercely contested presidential races in American history. Bryan made over 600 speeches in 27 states. The McKinley campaign got manufacturers and industrialists to inform their employees that if Bryan were elected, all factories and plants would close and there would be no work. The ruse succeeded. McKinley beat Bryan by a small margin. Bryan ran for president again in 1900 and in 1908, but fell short each time. During the 1912 Democratic Convention, Bryan was a powerful figure who helped Woodrow Wilson win the nomination. When Wilson became president, he appointed Bryan as Secretary of State, but Bryan soon became disenchanted with the Wilson administration. Bryan served only two years in the Wilson administration before resigning in 1915 over the highly suspicious sinking of the Lusitania, the event which was used to drive America into World War I. Although William Jennings Bryan never gained the presidency, his efforts delayed the money changers for 17 years from attaining their next goal, a new privately owned central bank for America. Now it was time for the money changers to get back to the business of a new private central bank for America. During the early 1900s, men like J.P. Morgan led the charge. One final panic would be necessary to focus the nation's attention on the supposed need for a central bank. The rationale was that only a central bank can be prevent bank failures. Morgan was clearly the most powerful banker in America and a suspected agent for the Rothschilds. Morgan had helped finance John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Empire. He had also helped finance the monopolies of Edward Harriman in railroads, of Andrew Carnegie in steel, and of others in numerous industries. But on top of that, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, had been America's financial agent to the British. After his father's death, J.P. Morgan took on a British partner, Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England. In fact, upon Morgan's death, his estate contained only a few million dollars. The bulk of the securities most people thought he owned were, in fact, 
owned by others. In 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt allegedly went after Morgan and his friends by using the Sherman Antitrust Act to try to break up their industrial monopolies. Actually, Roosevelt did very little to interfere in the growing monopolization of American industry by the bankers and their surrogates. For example, Roosevelt supposedly broke up the standard oil monopoly, but it wasn't really broken at all. It was merely divided into seven corporations, all still controlled by the Rockefellers. The public was aware of this thanks to political cartoonists like Thomas Nast, who referred to the bankers as the Money Trust. By 1907, the year after Teddy Roosevelt's re-election, Morgan decided it was time to try for a central bank again. Using their combined financial muscle, Morgan and his friends were...